Well, good morning and happy Mother's Day to all the mothers out here, all the mothers joining us from the stream. Happy Mother's Day to you, and good morning to everybody who isn't a mother. We're glad you're here, too, and joining us on the stream, so good morning, everyone. My name is Brian. I'm part of the team here at Lakeside, and we are so glad that you are spending part of your Mother's Day with us today. It was my son's, my oldest son's first baseball practice of the season on Monday, and I was there at the practice along with my wife and our youngest son, and we were over to the side, and my youngest son and I were playing catch as I was watching my older son and his team out on the field do some drills. And my youngest son and I kept throwing the ball back and forth, and then he decided he wanted to race, and I'm like, go find your mom. Uh, and then he found Brooke, and then they went for a race, and that was great because that left me the opportunity to just sit and watch my oldest son's baseball practice. Now, I don't know if you're a baseball fan, but sometimes if you go to a major league baseball game, if you have an opposing team around some fans for the home team, and, and they're, it's, it's all good-natured, but sometimes if they're talking smack back and forth, all of a sudden from the dugout, the fans will be hit with either some sunflower seeds or some peanuts just, uh, just thrown out from the dugout. And as I'm sitting and watching practice, all of a sudden all these sunflower seeds come flying out of the dugout all the way around me, and I just start laughing because nobody that I saw in practice up to this point had the ability to throw that well. So I was highly impressed <laughs> at whoever it was that threw all these sunflower seeds at me, but there were no players in the dugout, so I was a little confused. And then a, an older guy comes walking out of the dugout, and I'm like, okay, I don't recognize you. A little weird, but maybe you're just overly friendly and, and thought you'd prank somebody you've never met before. Not my strategy, but whatever works for you. And he's like, hey, what was that? And I'm like, yeah, pretty good throw. He's like, no, I didn't do it. I'm like, what? He's like, I, I didn't do that. And the, the closer I looked, the sunflower seeds that were thrown at me but didn't hit me were bird poop. And uh, <laughs> all of a sudden, I was really excited that none of what I thought were sunflower seeds had hit me. And it was just like a perfect, like I dodged it perfectly. I felt like I should be in the next Bond movie or something, just completely dodged it perfectly. Just, a, just one of those moments you just take a deep breath, thank you, Lord. I completely dodged it. This is fantastic because there's bird poop literally all the way around me. But then I started to panic a little bit because I'm like, I don't have, I just don't have that ability. And so I started looking at myself and I'm like, no, okay, okay, I'm good. I'm good. Great. And then Brooke comes back over and uh, she's talking to me and she goes, what's on your shirt? <laughs> like, what? She's like, right there, you have a spot on your shirt. What's that? And I'm like, oh. Well, a, a bird just pooped, and uh, it got me. And as soon as I said, at least none of it got on me, just on my shirt, she said, oh, it's in your hair. <laughs> now, I am not a germaphobe per se, but I value cleanliness. And uh, I'm like, we need to go to the car right now and get a baby wipe. And so we ran over to the car and we got a baby wipe. And my wife loves me so much that she took the baby wipe through my hair and got the bird poop out of my hair. And I'm like, I just need to leave practice and go shower and go change my clothes. And she's like, but practice is going to be over. I said, it's a park. You can stay here all night. What's the matter? And she's like, no, just, just wait until practice is over and I did not feel good that night until I could go home and shower like it just felt off and disgusting and dirty and just felt weird I'd searched all over me and I thought I was clear but the more searching that was done all of a sudden Brooke discovered that there was indeed something there this morning we're going to continue what we started last week when we started a look at the New Testament book of First Peter. So if you have your phones or your tablets, I'd invite you to follow along with us in the Bible app. It's a free resource that you can access in the app store of your choosing, completely free of charge. And once you've downloaded the Bible app on your device, 
there's a feature within it called events. And there, either enable your locations or type in zip code 54201, and Lakeside Community Church will pop up. You can follow along with us that way. If you have a traditional Bible with you, again, we're going to be in the New Testament book of 1 Peter chapter 1. We're going to start this morning in verse 10. And if you're joining us on the stream, thank you for joining us. The verses will be available on the screen below. Just to catch you up, last week when we saw the beginning of 1 Peter, what we saw was Peter was writing a letter to a bunch of people that followed Jesus who were experiencing a rough time in their lives. They followed Jesus and they were experiencing personal persecution because they were followers of Jesus. And so they scattered from their homes, they scattered from the lives that they knew in order to avoid this persecution, in order to escape and keep their lives. And Peter sent them a letter, and in the start of the letter, he told them the best is yet to come. The best is yet to come. Remember the benefits of following Jesus. Remember the benefits of following Jesus and know that the best is yet to come for all of us who've made the decision to follow Jesus, that we experience part of that promise, yes, in this world, but there's a, another aspect in the life to come that we experience as a result of following Jesus. And it's on that foundation today that we continue in 1 Peter chapter 1, beginning in verse 10, where we read these words concerning this salvation. The prophets who prophesied about the grace that was to be yours searched and inquired carefully. Let me read that again. Concerning this salvation, the salvation that you've experienced, people who've made the decision to follow Jesus, the prophets who prophesied about the grace that was to be yours searched and inquired carefully. So here Peter is reminding those who've made the decision to follow Jesus that hundreds and thousands of years before they were ever born, there were prophets who were given glimpses of the promise that God had not yet fulfilled in what would be the crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus. Hundreds of years before Jesus was crucified, God gave glimpses of this to the prophets, and the prophets recorded this. They wrote it down, and they recorded this. Now, this is important. This is important for, for a couple of reasons, and we're going to look at that in just a couple minutes. But first, before we get into that, let's remember a couple things. First, remember that if you're a follower of Jesus, the best is yet to come. The best is yet to come. No matter what you're facing, no matter what you're experiencing now, whether it's the lowest of low points in your life or the highest of high points in your life, the best is still yet to come. And the second thing I want you to remember is this. Remember the salvation you've experienced. Remember the salvation you've experienced. Now, some of you have made a decision to follow Jesus recently, and so this isn't difficult for you because you've recently made the decision to follow Jesus, and so it's fresh in your mind, and you are at the forefront of your mind is, is the remembrance of the change that God has done in your life, and it's fresh, and it's new, and it's exciting, and the Bible tells us that you have made the greatest transformation that is possible. Scripture tells us that before a relationship with Jesus, we're dead. But because of a result of a relationship with Jesus, we have crossed over from death to life. There is no greater transformation than that possible. That we've crossed over from death to life. The Bible tells us we are literally new creations once we've made the decision to follow Jesus. And so if you've recently made that decision, it's at the forefront of your mind. And there's an enthusiasm and an excitement in your life because you remember how your life was going. You remember what you were, but now you see what you are. And it's at the forefront of your mind. You don't need any reminder. But some of us made a decision to follow Jesus a long time ago. And if we're not careful, what happens is that enthusiasm and that excitement, it begins to wane. We begin to grow accustomed to the fact that we've experienced this. And what happens is we start to take it for granted if we aren't careful. So, couple things that those of us who made the decision to follow Jesus have to remember as we, go, as we go through this today. The first is this, the best is yet to come. And the second thing is remember what God has done in our lives. Remember the change that God has done in each and every one of our lives. Remember the difference that God has made in us. 
He goes on in verse 11. Inquiring what person or time the Spirit of Christ in them was indicating when he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the subsequent glories. Now again, we're talking about the prophets who hundreds and thousands of years before Jesus came, before Jesus was crucified, were writing about what Jesus was going to do and the grace that God would offer us through the sacrifice of Jesus. They were inquiring what person or time the Spirit of Christ in them was indicating when he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the subsequent glories. And here we see that the prophets, they want to know more. They want to know more. It's like a great novel that you're reading, and you hope you're reading it on vacation because you just want to be able to pour through. It's got you. You are gripped, and you want to see how it ends. You want to see how the story develops. That's what's going on here in the prophet's world. They're given these pictures, but they're not given the full picture. They're given these glimpses, and they want to know more. Or maybe you're not much of a reader. Maybe it's a Netflix series or a movie that completely grips you, not something you're texting through because you already know how it's going to end like every episode of SVU that's ever been created. No, this is something that really grips you, and you're watching intently because you want to know how the story is going to develop and how it's going to end. And that's what was going on in the prophet's worlds and in the prophet's life. And why does this matter to us? Well, I'm going to tell you in just a minute why this matters to us. And verse 12 gives us the answer of why this matters and how this is so incredible. How this is so incredible and how it changes the, the scope of our lives and how it changes how we live as well. Yes, because of the grace, but also personally, it changes something as well. Because verse 12 tells us this. It was revealed to them, it was revealed to the prophets that they were serving not themselves, but you. In the things that have now been announced to you, through those who preach the good news to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, things into which angels long to look. Why is this so incredible? Yes, it's incredible because God is giving the prophets hundreds of years before Jesus was born glimpses into the plan of grace. And why is this so incredible? Because these prophets who would die before Jesus was ever born, and who would look forward to the coming of Jesus, but they would never experience getting to see all the pictures and all the pieces and all the glimpses that God gave them come to fruition in their lifetime, they still didn't quit their job. They still didn't quit what God had in store for them. And in fact, they devoted their lives to something they would not get to see come to full fulfillment in their lifetime. They devoted their lives to the betterment of others. Their entire life was devoted to your benefit and my benefit and the benefit of people who shortly after Jesus died and rose again would make the decision to follow Jesus and that they would have to leave their homes, they would have to leave their families, they would have to leave their worlds behind because they were persecuted for following Jesus. And hundreds of years before any of that would come into play, there were people who devoted their lives to giving the pictures of this story that these people would get to experience, that we would get to experience in our lives. They devoted their life to something they would not get to experience. And we live in a time in our culture that tells us that you should serve yourself first and foremost. That if something doesn't have benefit for you, whether it's remuneration or whether it's to build your legacy or whether it's to build your following, that you need to put yourself first and you need to build your brand and you need to build your following and you need to build your empire. And what, what scripture tells us in the picture that we're given here is totally countercultural to that. It says, if you want to be great, serve others, not yourself. You want to be great, serve others, not yourself. Devote your life, devote your life to others. This is the picture that we're given here. Serving not themselves, but others. And the reason that this matters so much is number one, because every single one of us can think back in our lives and we know the specific names of people that made a difference in our lives. Whether it was a teacher, 
whether it was a doctor, whether it was a friend, whether it was a parent of a friend, whether it was a pastor, whether, whether it was just somebody in the neighborhood, whether it was a little league coach, we can think back and we know those names of the people that made a difference in our lives. And those are people without fail. Those are people who sacrificed something. Those are people who took time out of their life to serve us. who could have done something else with their life, but instead they chose to pour into us. And we all have those people that we can think through and that we can name. And, and one, of, one of the reasons that this is so important is because my names are different than your names. Even if, even if we grew up in the same city, my names would be different than your names because you and I are not wired alike. My wife tells me nobody in the world's wired like me. I don't know, maybe, all right? But we're not, we're not wired alike. We're wired very different. Every single one of us is wired differently. We have different passions. We have different abilities. And that is why when the church operates at its best, we are coming together and using all the different gifts and all the different abilities and all the different talents that people have to pour into the lives of others. Because you can reach people I can't reach, and I can reach people that you can't reach, and you can bless people that I can't bless, and I can bless people that you can't bless. It's why we're celebrating next week. For those that have volunteered at Lakeside in the last year, we have Volunteer Appreciation Night. And we get it. This isn't to guilt anybody. The last year's been chaotic, and it's been crazy. And if you haven't had the capacity in your life to serve here, we're not mad at you. We're not angry at you. But we're just going to celebrate those that have had that capacity and those that have had that opportunity. And it's going to be a great time. So if that's you and you have had the ability to serve here in the past year, I'm encouraging you, sign up to join us next Sunday night at Volunteer Appreciation Night at 630. And maybe you haven't signed up yet because you're a little freaked out that it's going to be a tie-dye explosion. And you're right, it's going to be, all right? It's going to be offensive how much tie-dye you see. And maybe you haven't signed up because it's going to be a night that you can't just sit in your favorite recliner at home and watch cable news and think about how horrible the world is. And you're right, we're not going to have any of that going on. We're going to celebrate and we're going to have a great time and it's going to be exciting. So if you have had that opportunity, I'm encouraging you to join us. It's going to be a great time as we just say thank you and we celebrate what God is doing. And if you haven't had the opportunity to use your gifts and your passions here in the last year, this isn't to beat you up. We're not angry at you. We're not mad at you. But what we're saying is when you do have that opportunity, when you do have that capacity, join us. Join us. And if you need to know where to get started, then visit our website, lakeside-church.com slash help. And there you will see by area and by job all the different ways that you can get involved. And if you go to the website and you're like, ah, Nothing really, nothing really standing out to me, but God's given me a passion for this, and I really wish I could use this to, to do something, to make a difference. Then contact us. We're not crazy enough to think that we're the only people that have good ideas. Again, none of us are wired in the exact same way, and you might have a passion, and you might be wired to do something that we haven't even thought of yet. And just because we haven't thought of it yet doesn't mean that you're wrong for having that desire and that passion to do it. Let us know and let us know how we can equip you to make a difference with the life and with the talents and with the abilities that God has given you. Because God has wired us all to have an impact. And here's the dirty little secret. When we live our lives to serve others, when we pour into other people's lives, the dirty little secret is this that God blesses us and he blesses us in a way that we can't even fully explain. But it, it's, it's joyful and it's exciting when we have the opportunity to bless somebody else. And I hope you experience that. I hope you get what it's like to bless somebody who could never repay you. And you don't want to be repaid. You just want to use the talents and the gifts and the abilities that God has given you. And to see how God uses that for his glory. I want to talk to those of you who, who are parents and grandparents for just a minute. And the incredible opportunity that you have to, to pour into your kids and into your grandkids. 
Certainly, as I think through the people that had an impact on my life, my, my mom and my dad are, are right up there on my list. And on today, as we celebrate mothers, moms and dads, I just I want to remind you of the incredible opportunity that you have to serve your kids. Grandparents, I want to remind you of the incredible opportunity you have to serve your grandchildren. And make that, make that a practice in your life. Make that something that you do regularly, that you are pouring into your kids and your grandkids. Parents, make time for them. If you need to schedule it on a calendar, schedule it on a calendar, but do whatever it takes. And I know today as well, it can be a bittersweet day for some. That there's been a a desire in your life to have children, and, and maybe you've never got to experience that. Or others... For parents and grandparents, today is a sobering reminder of a relationship that is broken. And the hurt that comes along with that broken relationship and the desire that that your kids or your grandkids would walk with Jesus, the desire that your kids or grandkids would have a close relationship with you and just the pain that that you face every day of the fact that the relationship is not what you would want it to be. And I want you to know that as today can be difficult, that we, we come alongside you and we, we understand that pain and we are praying for and with you and we want to serve you. And I just want to encourage those of you who, who are in that situation where there, there is tension with your kids or your grandkids or in a situation where you wanted kids and for whatever reason weren't able to experience that in this world. What, what I want you to do is to not lose sight of the fact that you can still make a difference in people's lives. And I would just encourage you, don't quit. It doesn't have to be something major. Start small. Start small. It can just start with mentorship. It can start with with just finding somebody that there there needs to be a relationship with, and you build that relationship with them. Maybe it's something similar to the Boys and Girls Club. Maybe it's something similar to Big Brothers, Big Sisters. I don't know what it is and what it looks like in your context, but just start small and do something. Don't feel like this is something that can't ever be experienced because you were enabled, weren't able to have kids of your own or because of the children or grandchildren that you have, there's broken relationship with. And know again that we pray with you and we grieve with you if you find yourself in one of those situations. There's another aspect of this I want us just to pause on, and that's this, that we who've made the decision to follow Jesus, we have experienced something that angels themselves long to look into. Now, I don't know about you, but when I think about angels, I'm like, man, that sounds like a really cool job. You get to, you get to be in the actual presence of God. You get, to, you get to have direct relationship with God. God sends you to do some really cool missions in this world, and you get to do some really cool things. You look a little freaky based on what Ezekiel tells us about you. Like, touched by an angel was way off when Ezekiel tells us what angels look like. There's some freaky-looking things with eyes all over them and four face. I don't know. I didn't create them. I don't, I just, they look freaky, but they get to do some really cool things. And so I'm like, man, I would love, I would love to get to do what what the angels get to do and recognize that at the very same time, angels are looking at us and angels are like, I long to understand what people who've made the decision to follow Jesus get to understand that we who once rebelled against God are invited to have a relationship with God through his son, Jesus. The angels cannot fathom what we've gotten to experience. And again, I just want to encourage you, don't take it for granted. Don't take it for granted. Verse 13 goes on and says this, Therefore, preparing your minds for action and being sober-minded, set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Christ, remembering what God has done in our lives. What do we need to do? We need to recognize, we need to recognize that our minds, that our minds are an integral part of who we are as individuals. 
They're an integral part of who we are as individuals. And as such, God cares about our minds like he cares about every aspect of us. But our minds are part of our physical bodies as well. And every part of our bodies can become ill. And the the call for us is this. Remember what God has done in your life and therefore be proactive. Be proactive in your thought process. Now, if you've ever struggled with intrusive thoughts, those thoughts that come and that plague you and you don't feel like you can talk to anybody about them because they're horrible things that you think and they're not things that you agree with. In fact, they impact you to to your core and sometimes offend you to your core, but you can't seem to shake them and you just find yourself there with the thought over and over and over again in your mind, but it's a thought that you wouldn't share with anybody and you start to feel guilty and you're like, why am I even having this thought? And I just want to remind you, that we are not responsible for everything that goes through our minds. But at the same time, we must, we must be cognizant of the fact that not everything we think and not everything we feel is something we should pursue. Not everything we think and not everything we feel is something we should pursue. And so we're being told right here, here's what we need to do. First is prepare your mind for action. Prepare your mind for action. Well, how do we do that? We engage with Scripture. We engage with what we know to be true. We spend time praying. We memorize Scripture. We think through all the ways that God has blessed us, all the ways that God has been faithful in the past. If it helps to journal, we write those things down. And we prepare our minds for action by focusing on this. And the next is we're sober-minded. We're sober-minded. We recognize the fact that not every thought that comes into our minds is a thought worth pursuing and sometimes the things that come into our minds aren't aren't things we should pursue at all and recognizing that just because I think something just because I feel a certain way doesn't mean that I need to act upon it just because it's a thought that I had or it's because of a feeling that I had we're told just the opposite prepare our minds for action and be sober-minded so guard your thoughts guard your thoughts And we do that by preparing our minds and then processing through every thought that we have. Engage your mind. Don't just follow it. Just because you have the thought, just because you have the feeling, just because you have the emotion doesn't mean it's right. You have to process through those things. We're all going to think some wrong thoughts and make sure we are taking the time to prepare our minds first and foremost, but then also be sober-minded and to process through through the thought as well. And what do we need to set our minds on, ultimately? Well, it's this, the hope that we have. The hope that we have brought to us by the revelation of Jesus Christ. The hope that we have, which is in the grace that God has offered to us. The grace that God has offered to us. Set our hope fully on the grace of Jesus. The grace that God offers to us, that because God loves us even when we have nothing to offer him, God offers us a relationship with himself through his son, Jesus. It's not offered to us because of the acts of service that we do to other people. It's not offered to us because of those things, but it's offered to us because God loves us. It's not that, ooh, if I can do more good in my life than I did bad, I somehow earn my way to heaven. It doesn't work that way. It isn't, ooh, if I'm a good person, then I can earn my way to heaven. Because some people might say, I'm a good person. And other people might look at me and say, well, you're not a good person. And they'd be wrong, but they might look at me and say, you're... there should have been a lot more laughter at that. I'm really starting to worry about how you guys feel about me, all right? Just saying. So, they're, they're... But somebody could say, I'm not a good person. Then what's the scale? What's the scale? It's not an issue of whether or not I'm a good person. It's not an issue of whether or not I do enough service. It's not an issue of whether or not I can buy something. It's a gift that's given to us through what Jesus has done on our behalf. What prophets wrote about that they would not get to fully experience in their lifetime. What we look back at. It's offered to us through grace. 
And as obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance. The passions of former ignorance. We're again, we're all going to have thoughts. We're all going to have feelings. We're all going to want to do certain things. I don't expect anybody who doesn't follow Jesus to live a life that honors God. Why would they? But for those of us who've made the decision to follow Jesus, our lives should honor God. And here's the deal with our lives and with this idea of service as well. Do we have an obligation as people who follow Jesus for our lives to honor God? Yes. Do we have an obligation for those of us who've made the decision to follow Jesus to serve other people? Yes. But the problem comes when we look at it like that. When we look at it like, oh, this is my obligation. Because then we start to feel like, well, I have to do this. And I have to do that. And there's no joy in that. What I want us to do is I want us to experience this as, yeah, it's an obligation, but more so, it's an opportunity for us. It's an opportunity for, live, for me to live my life and bless other people when I serve them. It's an opportunity for me to live my life and honor God with my life so that when people look at my life, what they see is they see more, more of God at work in me than they see me. That when they look at my life, they see love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self control. Yes, it's an obligation because I follow Jesus, but it's an opportunity. And my challenge for all of us who made the decision to follow Jesus is this. Yes, it's the obligation, but if you're looking at it like an obligation, it becomes tiresome. And it becomes a cycle where we feel like, Oh, I'm never going to me measure up. I'm always going to fall short. And when we throw that thinking aside and when we view it as the opportunity, we find joy in serving. We find joy in being the people that God's created us to be. We find joy in living our lives to honor God and letting him go to work and change who we are and change us from the inside out. But as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct since it is written, you shall be holy for I am holy. For those that have made the decision to follow Jesus, yeah, your obligation is to look like God, but it's your opportunity. It's your opportunity. Why? Because the one we follow is holy. And when our destination is heaven, our lives shouldn't look like hell. But we should honor God with the lives that we lead. Here's what I want to ask you. Is your life, is your relationship of following Jesus one that is primarily viewed at by you as an obligation, or is it an opportunity? Make no mistake, there is an aspect of this that is an obligation, but when we look at it like I have to instead of I get to, we lose our joy. And my hope and my prayer for you is that you would experience what it's like to follow Jesus with excitement and enthusiasm to use the gifts and the talents and abilities that God has given you to pour into the lives of others and to, uh, to get that feeling of what it's like to bless and serve somebody else who can never repay you. And the dirty little secret is you don't want repaid anyways. To feel what it's like to live a life where you follow after God wholeheartedly. And you recognize you're going to slip up. And you recognize you're going to fall along the way. And not that, not that that doesn't impact us, but at those times where we do slip up and at those times where we do fall short, we're remembering what the prophets wrote about hundreds and thousands of years before Jesus was even born. The hope that we have isn't because of what we do. The hope that we have isn't because it's something that we can be earned. The hope that we have is because of God's grace. Offered to every single one of us. Something that we could never repay. But something that God accomplished on our behalf. You have the opportunity you have the opportunity to honor God with your life. And how do you do that? Well, it starts, it starts with your mind. 
It starts with your mind. And are you going to view it as the opportunity or an obligation? And if you view it as strictly an obligation, your life is going to be one where you are constantly faced with this idea of, I have to do this, and I have to do that. And it's going to be hard for you to find joy. I hope instead you view it as the opportunity that it is for God to work within you. For you to become more like God and in the process become changed. In the process to serve other people, to impact their lives in ways they'll never forget. You may never know, but they will never forget. And for those that have made the decision to follow Jesus, to never lose sight of the gift that we've been given, the gift of his grace. And when we keep that at the forefront of our minds, when we prepare our minds for action by remembering what God has done for us and in us and through us, then we serve others. And we follow after God, not begrudgingly, as an obligation, but willingly as the incredible opportunity that it is. God, I pray that we would be people who follow you with full joy. I pray that we would be people who view following and serving you, God, not begrudgingly, not as an obligation, but as an opportunity. God, that we would be people who love the prospect of following you, who love the prospect of bettering the lives of others and helping them in their journeys. God, thank you for the people in our lives who made a difference. Thank you for the, the parents, and the grandparents, the teachers and the coaches. pastors, the neighbors, the friends and co-workers who've impacted each and every one of us. God, may we be those people to others, not begrudgingly, but willingly, full of enthusiasm and excitement. May we follow you, God, God, change us. We ask that you would work in us and through us for your glory, Jesus. In your name we do pray. Amen.